portfolio questions, and the portfolio is Constitution, External Affairs and Culture. Uh, anybody wishing to ask a supplementary question on any of the questions, could they please press the request to speak buttons, put an R in the chat function during the relevant question. Uh, and I call question number one. What you lose in SPCB questions, you gain back very quickly in Constitution questions. Question number one, Rachel Hamilton. Sorry, Presiding Officer. Um, to ask the Scottish Government what support it is offering communities and organisations across Scotland to mark the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. Cabinet Secretary. <laughs> Thank you. I'd delight to hear the question. Um, the Queen's Platinum Jubilee is a significant milestone, and the Scottish Government welcomes the celebrations which will take place across the country throughout this special year. Jubilee celebrations are commonly community-led, and Scottish Government officials are ensuring Lord Lieutenants, community councils and local authorities are informed of opportunities to be involved in these celebrations. Rachel Hamilton. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The, Minister, uh, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware that the UK Government has funded the Queen's Platinum Jubilee Fund 2022, and crucially, £70,000 has been earmarked for Scottish Borders Council. I would like to ask the Cabinet Secretary what specific support is the Scottish Government offering to local communities, local authorities and charities to help their celebrations of this magnificent milestone in Her Majesty's the Queen's reign? Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish uh, Government's uh, officials are working with Her Majesty's personal representatives in Scotland, the Lord Lieutenants, to promote the community-led events, which are so much a part of the historical celebrations of Royal Jubilees. We are also engaged with the Queen's Green Canopy via our executive agency, Forest and Land Scotland. If there is anything particular about um, uh, what is planned for uh, Scottish borders, I would be delighted to hear and hear any suggestions about how uh, those particular projects can be supported further. Thank you. Question number two was not lodged. So question number three, Donald Cameron. <coughs> to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on any legal advice it has sought for its proposed independence referendum bill. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. It is a long-established convention of this and previous governments that legal advice is not disclosed other than in exceptional circumstances. This reflects the public interest in the provision of free and frank legal advice, maintaining the right to confidentiality of communications between legal advisers and clients. Donald Cameron. Thank you for the answer. I've got a very specific supplementary question. I'm not asking for the content of any legal advice. I'm asking, has the Scottish Government taken legal advice, whether internally or externally, whether from the Lord Advocate or from any lawyer, on the question if its proposed independence referendum is within the legislative competence of this Parliament. Can he answer yes or no? Cabinet Secretary. I am going to rest on the answer that I gave uh, previously um, to, to the learned gentleman who, as a member of the Faculty of Advocates, is well aware uh, of the custom and practice in relation to, uh, uh, to the Convention of Legal Advice. And I am not going to depart from that tradition today, although I am grateful for his opportunity to do so. <coughs> Two brief supplementaries on the legal advice. First, uh, Co-Cab Stewart. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, would the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that if members of the Opposition are so keen to discuss the ongoing preparatory work for an independence referendum, they should join us in calling the UK Government to honour the democratic mandate granted by the Scottish people so that an open and fully informed dialogue on the opportunities of independence can begin as soon as possible? Cabinet Secretary, not directly related I, I, to legal I, I, advice, I, but a brief response, please. I would agree, and I, I welcome the point raised by my colleague. 72 of the 129 MSPs elected uh, to this chamber were elected on manifestos that commit them uh, and this Parliament and this Government to a referendum on Scottish independence during this Parliament. The Butte House Agreement reached between the Scottish Government and the Scottish Green Party confirms and strengthens that clear mandate, and it would be disappointing if democratically elected members of this or any other parliament would seek to undermine the democratically expressed wish of the electorate in elections as was cast last year. Willie Rennie. It, it is extraordinary that the minister can't even acknowledge whether he's sought advice, not what that advice is, but whether he's even asked for that advice. Because I think this parliament deserves to know whether the government has done its due diligence whether it's carried out all the right preparations on a legal basis, not what that advice is, 
but whether he's even bothered to ask. So can he give us an answer to that? Has he asked and has he received it? Cabinet Secretary. Forgive me, I don't know if Willie Rennie came into this uh, portfolio questions uh, not having heard me give the earlier answer, because my answer hasn't changed. So rather than reading out the question that he wrote before arriving, perhaps he would have listened to the answer I gave earlier, and I rest by it. Question number four, Jamie Honker Jones. Government, whether it will ensure that any proposed legislation in the Constitution of External Affairs and Culture portfolio is brought forward in a fair and transparent manner. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, all legislation the Government brings forward will continue to be of the highest standard and open to the full scrutiny of Parliament. Jamie Hulker Jones. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Unfortunately, that response and the response he gave to my colleague Donald Cameron and to Willie Rennie strikes at the very heart of fairness and transparency and suggests that uh, that's not the case. If the Cabinet Secretary is to maintain the ridiculous position that, in his own government's words, it's not in the public interest for the people of Scotland to know even about the existence on advice of the legality of their proposals, then it's clear secrecy has trumped transparency. So can I ask the Cabinet, can I give him an opportunity again? Has the Scottish Government taken legal advice on their plans for another referendum? And if he still refuses to stay, will he at least tell us whether, as they did in 2013, will they spend taxpayers' money defending and pretending or uh, trying to hide that information from the public this time round. Cabinet Secretary. So it's a curious thing, Deputy Presiding Officer, in that we now have a third member who didn't listen to the answer to the question that I... I, I well, forgive, for, forgive me, forgive me, Deputy Presiding Officer. Give, give me a moment so that I can answer the question in exactly the same form as I already did. And with your indulgence, it reads as follows. It is the long-established convention of this and previous governments that legal advice is not disclosed other than an exceptional circumstance. Rather than barracking, rather than barracking, the Conservative benches should listen to the answer having asked for one. Other than in exceptional circumstances, this reflects the public interest in the provision of free and frank legal advice, maintaining the right to confidentiality of communications between legal advisers and clients. Thank you. And a supplementary from Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that Tory MSPs should be more concerned at the abysmal record of their own party and UK party leader, which in the last few years alone includes illegally proroguing the Westminster Parliament, breaking procurement regulations when handing Gibson, could manufacturing you resume your contracts, seat, please? I've got a point of order. Point in the, of order, in the middle of a question. As much as I yeah. enjoy Kenny Gibson's um, interventions on these sorts of things, surely, Presiding Officer, they should actually be relevant to the question that was asked. <laughs> The Mr. Gibson the was in, Mr Gibson was in the midst of his question. I am sure he will tie it back in to the <coughs> substance of the relevant question. Mr Gibson, continue. Yes. Uh, do you wish me to start again the question? I wish you to tie it into the question to which this is a supplementary, Mr Gibson. Yes. Breaking procurement regulations and handing out PP manufacturing contracts to unsuitable companies at inflated prices and breaking COVID regulations all without any transparency. <laughs> Cabinet Secretary, <laughs> as briefly as possible. Uh, yes, I do agree. Um, uh, what were the shifting sands of explaining parties in Downing Street the unknown costs for their union unit, or as it's now called the Union Strategy Committee, which is buried within a headline figure of £81 million, the courts finding their COVID contracts going to party supporters unlawful. The lack of interest from the Conservative benches does appear to follow that old adage of do as we say, not as we do, as is so often the case, the double standards the double standards of the Tories help to make the case for independence. Thank you. Questions number five and uh, number six are, uh, are joined. We start with Fiona Hislop. Question number five. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it has made on identifying support and aid that it can provide for people in Ukraine and Ukrainians leaving their country and seeking refuge. Minister Neil Gray. Thank you, President Officer. We've provided £4 million in humanitarian aid as part of global humanitarian efforts. £1 million has been allocated to the British Red Cross and SCIAF, £2 million via the DEC appeal launched in Scotland, and £1 million to UNICEF, focusing on protecting children. Our first donation of medical supplies arrived in Poland on Thursday. The second donation it left Scotland on Friday included more than 130,000 items of medical supplies, and I was fortunate enough to be able to see that shipment leave Eurocentral and thank all those who have helped to turn that around so quickly. We continue to press the UK 
government uh, to waive visa requirements for Ukrainian nationals and to offer immediate refuge and sanctuary for those who may be displaced. Today's Home Office announcement does not go far enough. Scotland is ready to offer a warm welcome to people fleeing Ukraine. Fiona Hislop. I thank the Minister for that update. Today's uh, UK Home Office announcement of a streamlined virtual visa application process for Ukrainians is positive. But does the Minister agree that what we really need is a fundamental shift by the UK to change the rules, not just the processes? Ukrainians still have to apply for visas. We have many seasonal workers in Scotland who can't even bring their direct families here. We have a massive humanitarian crisis uh, faced by millions of Europeans, and the Home Office's response is poor and pitiful. Does he agree that the people of Scotland expect to help and the Ukrainians seeking shelter deserve uh, so much better? Minister. Yes, I do. And, and, and I support the passionate way in which uh, Fiona Hislop made her case there. The response of the UK government has been an international embarrassment. The UK's offer to Ukrainians is not a refuge route, but a bureaucratic family immigration route, leaving thousands literally out in the cold queuing outside visa application centres. Progress is being made. But waiving visa requirements and introducing a comprehensive settlement programme would resolve these issues if only there was a political will to do so. There seems to be no one outside of the Home Secretary who doesn't see the need for more urgent action. Question number six, Mark Griffin, who joins us from home. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what work it has undertaken with its partners and funding it has identified to accommodate, to accommodate refugees from Ukraine. Minister. Uh, thank you. The, Scotland has a proud history of welcoming refugees and people seeking sanctuary from war and violence. The Scottish Government and Scotland's local authorities have made clear to the UK Government uh, that we stand ready to offer, offer refuge and sanctuary where necessary for those who may be displaced. We are therefore working with the Home Office, uh, COSLA and local authorities and other partners to provide people with the safety and security they need to rebuild their lives. The, the UK Government's current proposals to support re Ukrainian refugees via community sponsorship uh, routes are insufficient and we are still waiting on the full details of how exactly that will work. We continue to urge the UK Government to develop a comprehensive uh, resettlement programme to ensure that Ukrainian citizens can be provided with the safety and security they need to rebuild their lives. Mark Griffin. Thank the Minister for that answer. The, the glacial response of the UK Government has been absolutely uh, appalling, but yesterday the Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice, Housing and Local Government said that the government is working at pace to ensure that we stand ready to receive people. Now, given the Home Office have finally said it will ease rent entry requirements, but not clearly not far enough, can the Minister confirm that accommodation and homes are being booked, capacity in schools has been identified, and funding is ready to welcome Ukrainians into communities here, since it's clear we can't wait for the UK government to develop a resettlement programme? Minister. Mark Griffin is absolutely right that the glacial pace at which this has been moving uh, is desperate. It's an international embarrassment. I can confirm to him that we are working on uh, all of those areas that he raises as potential routes to ensure that we can provide safe and secure long-term sustainable sanctuary uh, to people who are looking to flee uh, Putin's war in Ukraine. And two brief supplementaries. First, Eleanor Whitton. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Refer members to my um, register of interest. I am a serving councillor in East Ayrshire. COSLA has added the voice of Scotland's local authorities to that of the Scottish Government and Parliament in calling on the Home Secretary to step up the UK's Ukrainian refugee settlement programme, citing the expertise of Scotland's strategic migration partnership in supporting and integrating refugees and migrants into our community. Notwithstanding today's digital visa announcement, can the Minister comment on the Home Secretary's claim that the UK is doing everything possible to speed up the remarkably slow rollout of the visa scheme to Ukrainian refugees, especially in light of the full willingness of COSLA and our councils to play their part in this Europe-wide effort. As briefly as possible, Minister. Yeah, for doing everything possible, I think Reid uh, doing the least they feel they can get away with. We continue to call on the UK Government to urgently develop a proper resettlement programme. One of the reasons that the Syrian resettlement programme was successful is that it was a comprehensive programme where partnerships worked to support people in need. And I'm proud that all 32 Scottish local authorities participated in that programme, welcoming over 3,300 refugees into their communities. People and families were able to 
to settle, make Scotland a home. I want to see that again. However, to do so, it is vital that rapid, safe and legal routes be established immediately and that the millions fl fleeing war are given sanctuary through such a programme. Scotland stands ready to offer such a warm welcome and refuge to those who need a home. And Sarah Boy. Thank you. Can I first of all commend the uh, committee discussion we had this morning to the Minister? There were some excellent suggestions made there, in particular to gear up not just our councils but the voluntary sector as well to support people coming to Scotland for a raft of reasons. But can you also make a commitment to address the issue of working with our business communities and public sector partners to support fundraising for the Disasters Emergency Committee? Um, to enable staff to make donations, but also to do work to develop work visas so that people from Ukraine who have skills and talents are able to come to work in Scotland. Minister. Yes, I, I agree with Sarah Boyack there, and, and she uh, thankfully gives me the opportunity to once again thank the people of Scotland for their incredibly generous support uh, for the Disasters Emergency Committee appeal, over £10 million that has been raised here in Scotland for, for that, which makes sure that we are getting uh, financial aid to where it is needed most effectively and, and quickly. On the other points around how we can support uh, people arriving here in Scotland, we are working, as I said, as I said previously to Mark Griffin, across all all areas of society to make sure that we have a coordinated response uh, that ensures that people have a safe and secure place to call home when they arrive in Scotland. Question number seven, Mercedes Vialba. Thank you. Um, to ask the Scottish Government what progress it is making towards the establishment of a peace institute by the end of 2022, as set out in its 2021-22 programme for government. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, following an open tender process in January, we have contracted a consortium of expert researchers to help inform our thinking on Scotland's future peace offer. They will report back to us in the summer. Never has there been a more pertinent time to discuss Scotland's approach to peace and to reconciliation. Mercedes Vialba. I thank the Minister for his response. The Scottish Government have committed to establishing a peace institute with a focus on human rights by the end of this year. Amnesty International recently published a report into Israel's apartheid against Palestinians, which includes the call for states to immediately suspend the direct and indirect supply, sale or transfer of arms to Israel. So will the Scottish Government's Peace Institute have the scope to review the nearly £10 million in Scottish Enterprise grants to arms companies which sell weapons to Israel, given the human rights abuses faced by Palestinians? Can I say I would very much welcome uh, the input of members right across the chamber about particular issues or causes or areas in which Scotland's uh, Peace Institute could play a meaningful role, and I would uh, commend the member, but anybody else, uh, for becoming involved in that process as we are considering the form in which a Peace Institute may take. So I, I would encourage her, please, to get in touch with any issues that she or colleagues feel should be considered uh, as we make the preparations to, to step up and stand up at the Peace Institute that has been planned. And supplementary, Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. Will the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that the example set by our northern European neighbours, such, such as Norway, illustrates the positive dif diplomatic influence that nations of Scotland's size and character can have in promoting peace on the world stage? Cabinet Secretary. Um, Norway is home to the Peace Research Institute in Oslo that explores peaceful re uh, relations between states, between groups and peoples. Our own research will consider the Norwegian approach and those of other nations to help us determine Scotland's distinct peace offer. Like other nations of its size, Scotland has a wealth of soft power resources, in other words, assets making us an attractive, a trustworthy partner. And the Scottish Government recognises that a good international reputation is produced by the country as a whole and will continue to collaborate with others to promote Scotland and our values on the international stage. Thank you. And question number eight, Dean Lockhart. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what support it provided to Seen Stirling and other organisations as they prepared Stirling's bid to be UK City of Culture in 2025. Minister. Uh, let me first congratulate Stirling for reaching this stage in the competition. We expect the shortlist to be announced around the end of this month. Officials met with the Stirling bid team to offer support and make, uh, help make connections with relevant partners. Additionally, uh, officials work closely with Visit Scotland and Creative Scotland, who sit on the bid working and steering groups and provided input uh, on the bid proposal. Seen Stirling and Stirling Place Partnership is jointly funded by Creative Scotland and Stirling Council and recently received a further £50,000 from Creative Scotland to build on their successful partnership work. Dean Lockhart. 
I thank the Minister for that response and also for his comments about Stirling. Achieving the status of UK City of Culture 2025 would be a fitting accolade for the whole of the Stirling region, surrounding communities and indeed Scotland. The bid reflects the unique historic, cultural and architectural heritage of Stirling and is also evidence of great collaborative work across the public, private and third sectors. Does the Minister agree that achieving the status of UK City of Culture 2025 would see great benefits for the whole of the Stirling area and its constituents? Minister. Uh, yes, I do. Uh, I, I went, my alma mater is the University of Stirling, so I have a, a bit of an affinity there. Uh, and yeah, I can see the obvious benefits that this would bring uh, to Stirling and, and the local area. Again, wish uh, the bid team every success in the shortlisting process, and we stand ready to continue to support as best we can, uh, depending on that outcome. I've got a couple of supplementaries, hopefully on Stirling's bid, starting with um, Marie McNair. Thank you, President Officer. As Scotland emerges from the darkest days of the pandemic, many are again making the most of the rich cultural offerings all around us. Can the Minister outline the ways in which the Scottish Government is supporting our culture, heritage, creative industries to flourish in the COVID recovery? That isn't really related to the Stirling bid. Can you very, very briefly address that? Yes, thanks, Minister. President Officer. Uh, since the beginning of the pandemic, we've announced £256 million uh, support for cultural sectors, allowing libraries to reopen, supporting organisations and freelancers to keep working, bolstering creative industries and ensuring the continuation of children's creative learning. That work doesn't stop there. To give just a few more examples, Creative Scotland have launched a recovery fund, supporting organisations organization to rebuild musicians and artists to apply uh, for a Scotland on Tour fund to make new work across Scotland. Uh, and Screen Scotland has launched a fund to support cinemas to address the changes in the marketplace, including, I'm sure, the McRobert in Stirling. <laughs> Just at the end. Well done, Minister. Uh, Faisal Chowdhury. <clears throat> Thank you, Dep Deputy Presiding Officer. I wish Stirling's bid to be UK's city of culture every success, but it is becoming clear that many cultural events, outlets and institutions across Scotland are struggling to keep the doors open in the wake of the pandemic. What more can the Scottish Government do to ensure that the cultural organisations are supported so the, uh, that events like City of Culture have a fighting chance to return to Scotland in future? And the same approach, Minister. I, I thank uh, Faisal Chowdhury uh, for that question and recognising the challenges that there are um, in the cultural scene across Scotland and Stirling uh, as well. We continue to do what we can to ensure uh, that, the, uh, that that sector is supported. Since January 2022, we have committed £81 million uh, to the culture, heritage and events sectors to mitigate the impact of physical distancing and caps and attendances. Very alive to the issues that there are in the sector and I am meeting regularly with stakeholders to ensure that the government continues to do what we can to support them in the recovery. Thank you, Minister. That concludes portfolio questions. There will be a brief pause before we move to the next item of business.